The Acorn Electron, in the eyes of many a computer that was unsuccessful and nearly took Acorn under. And although you hear that often repeated, it's something yeah, I don't really agree with. Yes, for the first time on this channel, I'm going to be mildly controversial. This, this may be the closest to drama this channel ever does. Also, it is the Acorn Electron's 40th birthday. In fact, the week I'm making this video. Perhaps I should have led with that. But before we get to that, let's have a quick word from our sponsor, PCB Way. A company that mostly sponsors YouTube creators, but also has a nice sideline in the production of PCBs. Yes, printed circuit boards. Upload your design and PCBs arrive in the post. What more could you ask for? Well, a pick and place service, I guess, which they also do. And maybe solder stencils, which again, they also do, along with 3D printing and CNC machining. Acorn at the time was most known for their BBC microcomputer. A computer that, any way you look at it, was quite successful. But one of the markets it was struggling in was the home market, because the BBC Micro, it was not a cheap computer. I mean, a very capable computer, but cheap it was not. A BBC Model B, which is what most people went for, cost £399, this is in 1980s money, whereas the UK's best-selling home computer, the ZX Spectrum, well, that sold for £175 for the 48K version. And most of the things the BBC was better at were not the sort of things that were essential for a home user. For a home user, the biggest noticeable difference was that the BBC had a keyboard that didn't completely suck. Ooh, that comment's going to make for some angry responses in the comment section. Please don't. Now, this was not a fact that was lost on Acorn's management, which led Chris Curry to think they needed a cheaper version of the BBC Micro, one that they could sell into the home market. And this idea became what is known as the Acorn Electron. Now, it's fair to say that Acorn's engineers were not overly keen on the idea of developing the Electron. They felt what Acorn needed to do was concentrate on more powerful and more expensive systems, move the whole thing forward, rather than try and make a cut price version of the BBC. But their director, Chris Curry, was absolutely convinced that this is a thing that Acorn needed to do. They needed to be in that home market space and have a much larger presence there so more games would be developed for their platform. And the BBC at the price it was, well, it was never going to do that volume of business. Now, one of the reasons the BBC was so expensive is the sheer variety of features and all the chips needed to support that. I mean, for example, the BBC had a ton of expansion buses. You had the user port, you had the one megahertz bus, you had the tube port so you could add a second processor. And all of these things were great for the education market, for labs, scientific research, you know, you name it. But the home market, that wasn't a thing that most gamers wanted or needed. So most of that could be cut, and that would reduce the chip count somewhat. But there's still a heck of a lot of ICs left on the BBC Micro. Now, this is where Acorn took a leaf essentially from Sinclair's book. Instead of having lots of off-the-shelf ICs that they build this stuff out of, they were going to make themselves a custom ULA that would replace most of these chips. And this would dramatically cut the cost of implementing this machine. Now, this ULA is the key thing that was going to make the Acorn Electron affordable. It was also where almost all the work of developing the Acorn Electron was going to go. Now, ULAs have become fairly common in the world of 8-bit micros in the UK. The ZX Spectrum had one that did most of its video stuff. And even the BBC Micro had made some use of ULAs for the likes of its video chip. But this one, for the Electron, well, this was going to be the biggest ULA that anyone had ever made up until this point. Now, a ULA stands for Uncommitted Logic Array. And essentially, it's a process where a chip is pre-made with a number of logic gates in, and then another mask is placed on top to link those together to make your custom chip. Now, this is much cheaper than the alternative approach where you design a whole chip yourself and then manufacture it which is what Commodore did with the Commodore 64. But they, you know, owned Moz, who manufactured processors for a living. So if you don't already own a chip fab, this is the most cost-effective way to go at that point in time. The problem for Acorn and its engineers was that the number of gates they needed in their ULA to be able to implement the Electron, well, it was very close to the edge of what could be possibly done at that point in time. This was the biggest ULA anyone had ever made in terms of gate counts and was something Ferranti had only just started offering. And the problem with really new things like this is they don't always work as tiny as they should do. And Ferranti's new ULA didn't work as it was supposed to. I'm going to try and avoid doing an in-depth discussion of the ULA itself, because almost every video on the Acorn Electron seems to spend huge amounts of its time in the ULA, and 
There is justification for that because this was, as I've said earlier, one of the biggest duo lays to have ever been created at this point in time. It was the largest that could be made, and it is the thing that slowed down a lot of the engineering on the Acorn Electron, and is in fact where most of the time on engineering it went. The way I am going to try and discuss it is why it was so difficult and why it took so long. Now, we've already discussed its size. Yes, it was the biggest ULA possible at that point, but it wasn't orders of magnitude bigger. No, what really complicated this was tooling, or should I say, the complete absence of tooling. These days, if you want to design anything in the world of electronics, there are a ton of tools for each and every bit of that job. I mean, when ARM sit down and design a microprocessor now, they're not doing it on graph paper. Now, part of the reason for Acorn not having access to any tools was there wasn't a lot of tooling around anyway, but also Acorn did not have the kind of budget to spend on tooling. So they had one tool they developed internally, a BBC Basic program written by Sophie Wilson, that was there to help them do layout of the chip itself. But apart from that, yeah, there, there, there wasn't really anything for, you know, testing or checking the designs or anything like that. And that extended beyond just the chip design as well. I mean, let's have a look at the Acorn operating system for it, the MOS. Now, by the time of the Acorn Electron, responsibility for doing the MOS had been handed over to John Thackeray, who had no access to debuggers or other useful tools for when turning up the firmware for this thing, the OS. He was stuck with using the one bit of output on the Acorn Electron he could easily control when trying to get the operating system to start up, the caps lock light. He would put the code that turned on the caps lock light somewhere in his code. He would then put that into a ROM, put it in the Acorn Electron, fire it up. If the caps lock light switched on, he knew it had reached that block of code. And that was his whole debugging capability for getting the operating system working on the Acorn Electron. You can see why this may have taken some time. Now, the conventional narrative for the Acorn Electron goes, ULA difficult, that delayed the Electron, that's what led to all of Acorn's financial problems. And look, there is some truth to that. And it certainly was a major contributor to Acorn's financial issues. But there is a lot more here, and those buts, they are big buts, and I cannot lie. See, normally when a company like Acorn gets into trouble, we, we don't know exactly why. We don't have all the details. We know some of the big picture, because some of it's public. And the thing with the Electron is, it was a very public mess up. They told all the press they were going to have this machine ready in time for Christmas. And it was a lot easier to say it was entirely down to the ULA than it was to say, well, what the full details were. You see, in this one case, we actually have some pretty detailed information, because a report was produced by someone who had access to all of Acorn's people and their documentation. And the real problem was, small company grew too fast. Yes, the Electron was quite late sorting out its ULA, which delayed the machine. But it turns out if Acorn's management had understood all the details over shipping things in from abroad and actually booking shipping capacity, then those Acorn Electrons could have been on the shelf for Christmas. It would also seem that Acorn's management did not really understand the difference between shops saying how many units they wanted to be able to put on sale versus actual making real sales. When WH Smith says they want, say, 40,000 of these things, they don't mean we will pay you the money for 40,000 of these. They mean, keep 40,000 of these somewhere in a warehouse for them while we try and sell them. Now, if you're trying to manage your business's cash flow, that is an incredibly important distinction. But all of this so far makes it sound like Acorn's problems were down to just the Acorn Electron. But that's not that close to the truth either. If the only problem had been the delay in the Electron, well, Acorn probably would have been fine, but Acorn had other issues too. The parts of Acorn's business had essentially been burning through money. Their effort to get the BBC into America, which ultimately just failed, well, that burned an awful lot of cash. Then there was the Acorn business machine, Acorn's attempt to make a business platform that never really saw the light of day apart from the Cambridge workstation. And that thing was not a seller. And while they had all these calls on their cash developing all these things, they were also for some reason sponsoring a racing team. And that sort of thing is quite good fun, but it's not exactly an essential business function. It also seems that this is the time when Acorn fell out with its bankers as well. The way Acorn was handling cash is probably a big factor in that. With so much happening at Acorn at the time, and a lot of it not going overly well. But trying to blame all of that on the Acorn Electron being late, well, it's not really an accurate thing to say. 
Is it a contributing factor? Oh, yeah, sure, it, it definitely is, but it's by no means the sole cause. Now, luckily, Acorn was bailed out by Olivetti, and this seemed to get everything at Acorn running on a much more even keel. And also, Acorn had a lot of Acorn electrons it could sell, and sell them it did. The electrons often thought as an unsuccessful computer that didn't sell particularly well, but it's actually the third best-selling home computer in the United Kingdom for that period, which is a pretty good achievement given that it was a bit late to the party. And also, the sheer strength of the competition, it's not like there was a shortage of micros to compete for that home market against. I mean, you had all the UK's homegrown micros, as well as a whole bunch of ones from the US and other countries as well. Right, let's get ourselves a little look at this machine. As what they produced, it's a fairly capable home micro. Now, as you can see from the outside, we've got a good keyboard. This is actually a, a decent keyboard. You can type and program on this thing. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, yeah, so what? It's, it's got a decent keyboard. I mean, didn't all computers have a decent keyboard? No, no, they, they, they did not. I mean, let's look at the most successful one at that period in time, the Spectrum and its dead flesh rubber keys. I mean, this thing's not very nice to type on. and there are plenty of awful keyboards out there. The Spectrum is by no means the worst. I mean, let's have a look at the Mattel Aquarius. Yeah, drink it in. And then if you're thinking, well, at least it can't get worse than that, let me show you the ZX80 and 81, the Atari 400. So a keyboard that doesn't completely suck, not a given. You can also have a look at the range of ports on this on the side. We've got a UHF port, which is pretty standard for a home micro. Let you plug it into a TV, PAL in this case, obviously. You also have a monochrome composite output as well. Again, this was pretty common. You had this on the likes of the Speccy, for example. Where things get a little bit more sophisticated is we have an RGB output as well. This was not that common on home micros, or particularly British ones of the time. And this let you use a proper colour monitor with it and was exactly the same pin configuration used by the BBC Micro, so all of their monitors and leads were compatible. Then you also have the cassette port, which again, virtually every home micro of the time had, although there was a nice feature on the BBC one, where you had this idea that it could remotely stop and start the tape recorder, much in the same way as the custom one for the C64 did. And this cassette port from the BBC Micro, well, it's the exact same one on the Acorn Electron, so all the tape decks that had it all built in for doing the remote stop and start, well, yeah, that was all compatible as well. The other port we have is this expansion port on the back, we're going to come back to that one, because unlike most other home micros that had an expansion port, this one got used by, well, most Electron owners. Now, let's have a little look inside the Acorn Electron itself. Now, if we look at the PCB, you'll see it is a lot simpler than the BBC Micro one. I'll bring up the BBC's ones next to it. I mean, they really did achieve dropping the chip count on this thing. Now, the big square thing on the right of the board here, that's the famous ULA, and that's pretty much most of the computer in there. Below it there, we've got the RAM chips, and we'll come back to the memory later, because there's, yeah, there's something to be said about how memory was done in the Acorn Electron. The next major chip we have on there is the 6502 processor, and then that other big IC, that's the ROM that contains the operating system for the machine, and also the basic interpreter come assembler. Now, they managed to keep the Electron surprisingly compatible with the BBC Micro. It can do most of what the BBC can, and is sufficiently compatible that a lot of the BBC software can just run on the Electron, but by no means all. So, into this ULA, they managed to cram all the stuff necessary to do the BBC's graphics modes. Screen mode-wise, where there is an emission, is Mode 7, or the Teletext mode. In the BBC, it used a separate chip from the regular video chip to implement this Teletext mode. And in the Acorn Electron, that's just not there. Now, that Teletext mode was mostly used by applications and education software. Not something Acorn were particularly targeting with the Acorn Electron. They were after the home market and really cared about games more than anything else. So all the graphics modes used by games, they're, they're all there. It's just this Teletext mode that's missing. There is some emissions with regards to the CRT control. That means that some games for the BBC Micro that made really clever use of that thing, like a fire track, for example. Well, on the Electron, that's going to have to find a far less elegant solution. Another game that made some clever use of that was Elite, so it could change the screen mode partway down the screen so the bottom half of the screen could be in colour while the top half was black and white. On the Electron, that was not possible, so there needed to be a version of Elite for the Electron that was just black and white all the way down and didn't do the clever mode change thing partway down drawing the screen. 
The sound function was also a bit more limited on the Electron versus the BBC. On the BBC, you had three channels for doing notes, effectively music, and one noise channel. On the Acorn Electron, you had one channel for doing melody, and the noise channel was emulated in software, so it meant you couldn't really have music and sound effects noise at the same time. Oddly, this is not as limiting in games as you think it might be. It's not something you really notice that much. Performance-wise, it's often said the Electron runs at about half the speed of the BBC Micro, and this is one of these sort of true but also sort of not true things. Remember when I said I'd come back to RAM? Well, this is the moment where we're going to come back to RAM. One of the most expensive components in the computer is its memory. So here is where Acorn needed to save some costs in order to get the Acorn Electron to hit their target price. And it's this method of cost saving is where the whole it runs at half the speed thing comes from. Now, the Acorn Electron has 32 kilobytes of memory, same as the BBCB. The BBC's memory configuration was based on 16 kilobit chips. In fact, they had 16 of them. But by the time the Electron came round, well, there were 64 kilobit chips, and these were a lot cheaper for the number of bits you got. So the Electron used four of these to create its 32 kilobytes of memory. And while this was substantially cheaper, it did create a bit of a limitation. This is where the whole speed thing comes from, because you can only read four bits at once, or write four bits at once, whereas the BBC could read and write eight bits at once. Now, if you've got an 8-bit CPU like the 6502, there is an assumption that every time you read, you want to read eight bits. And every time you write, you want to write eight bits. So that means in order to write eight bits or read eight bits on the Acorn Electron, you needed two clock ticks to do it. So on the first tick, the CPU would read in four bits. On the second tick, it would read in the next four bits, and that way it read one byte. The BBC, however, could do that in one clock tick. So even though both machines had a CPU with exactly the same frequency as two megahertz, the BBC could read twice as many bits in the same time as the Acorn Electron could, from memory. However, when it came to the ROM that contained the operating system and the basic interpreter, well, that could be read 8 bits at a time, so the Acorn Electron was just as fast running code from the ROM. Now, Acorn had planned to make use of this and release games on ROM cartridges, but you will notice by default, there is no ROM cartridge slot on the Acorn Electron. Now, I will come back to this whole ROM cartridge thing in a bit, but suffice to say that most software was released on tape because every Acorn Electron had a cassette port. So most games did run at effectively half speed, if you like, or had half the CPU time available. Now, of course, that's something that most users didn't experience. They didn't experience games running half as fast as they did on the BBC. But the Acorn Electron versions would sometimes have less things in them. Less sprites would be on the screen at once, for example. Now, you might be thinking to yourself that this whole only being able to read four bits at RAM from once thing is quite the limitation, and, well, at least it can't get worse than that. Well, hold on to your hats, because, yeah, it's going to get a bit worse than that. The problem with only being able to read four bits from RAM when you've only got four memory chips is the CPU's not the only thing that's reading stuff from RAM. If you remember that giant ULA I mentioned, well, that's also got to read from memory, because that's got the graphics chip in it. Now, on the BBC, they got away with this because they put memory that could be accessed at 4 MHz in the machine. And as the CPU ran as 2 MHz, that meant half the cycles available to the RAM couldn't be used by the CPU. So they were used by the video ULA in order to be able to read memory to do the video display. Well, the memory in the Acorn Electron is 2 MHz memory, which means the clock frequency and the rate at which you can access the RAM are one and the same thing. So where does the ULA manage to get into memory. Well, the ULA is given control over the clock that goes to the CPU, and what it does is it stretches a clock cycle out for the CPU, effectively slowing it down and creating time for itself to access memory. So if the Acon Electron was half as fast in terms of only being able to read four bits at once rather than eight, well, the ULA then slows that down even further by holding the CPU's clock meaning that it isn't accessing memory Why it does its job. So the CPU is effectively waiting to get access to memory again. And this really was the kicker in the Acorn Electron's performance. This really did slow things down and made some of the graphics modes almost unusable for games. Now, here's where Acorn really missed a trick. All the graphics modes in the BBC, the standard ones, don't use memory in the first eight kilobytes of RAM. 
All the screen memory is mapped above that address, so we don't really need the ULA to access the first 8K. So if we could block the ULA from accessing the first 8K safely, and we know we could, and we'll come on to why we know that in a moment, well, then the CPU could have accessed at the full 2 MHz that first 8K. Now in a game, that's where most of your data and code goes, and most importantly, the first 255 bytes of RAM, because that's what the CPU can access in index mode, or page zero as it is otherwise known. And this is where the CPU could have a slightly shorter instruction, because instead of using the 16-bit addressing it normally uses, it can just use an 8-bit address, hence only being able to access the first 255 bytes of memory. Using this shorter addressing mode meant that the CPU instructions could be one byte shorter, and thus you could read a CPU instruction in less clock cycles. So having access to that memory as fast as you possibly could would make a big difference to games, because that's where they put their most performant code sections, in terms of not only the instructions, but also where the data would be. Now, to give you some idea of how bad this clock slowing could be, on some of the graphics mode that use quite a lot of memory, like the 20K modes, in order for the ULA to have enough time to be able to read that 20K often enough to refresh the screen, your CPU speed is down to about one megahertz. So you've lost approximately 50% of your clock cycles. Now, remember I said we knew we could safely block out this 8K for almost all software? Well, the reason we know that is someone came up with this idea we've just described and created some hardware to implement it. Initially, this hardware design was released in one of the Acorn magazines known as the Slogger Turbo. And it was something someone who was relatively handy with a soldering iron who didn't mind buying a few logic gates and a bit of Verastrip could put together themselves. In fact, I did. And this relatively small modification really did make quite a difference to how well the Acorn Electron performed. It's a real shame that this did not occur to Acorn at the time they were designing the Electron, because it really wouldn't have moved the needle on their production costs, but it really would have improved the performance of the machine. With that initial delay that prevented the Acorn coming to market for the 83 Christmas period, it meant that quite a few retailers and Acorn themselves were left with a lot of electrons they wanted to sell. So early in the machine's life, we started to see it getting discounted and, importantly, bundled with something called the Plus One. Now what the Plus One did was expand the Electron so we could have things like joysticks and a printer, but we also had these ROM cartridge slots as well in the top. Now I should mention expansions like the Plus One were not only made by Acorn, some third parties made them as well. And that's the version I've got here. This is a third party one, the Slogger one. And this has got a number of extra ROM slots in the top as well as the cartridge slots. So you can install some ROMs permanently on top. Now, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that Acorn planned to release some games on ROM cartridge for the Electron. After all, the idea being we could access these ROMs eight bits a clock cycle rather than four. So code running from the cartridge would run quicker than code running from memory. Except that's not what happened. When you put one of these ROM cartridges in, the ROM is mapped into the Acorn Electron's memory space, and it's mapped into address range above where normal memory is. And that's a key problem. Because if you've got a game you've already written to be loaded off tape for, say, the BBC or even the Acorn Electron, that game's written assuming it's living in the 32K of RAM. So, all the memory addresses and locations of variables, etc., are all assembled into the game in a fixed position. If you want it to run in the ROM range, well, you're going to have to modify that game to run in that location. And that's exactly what Acornsoft couldn't be bothered doing. Instead, these ROM cartridges use something called ROMFS, a ROM filing system that the Acorn Electron knew how to read. So, you would load your game from the ROM filing system into the regular RAM and run it from there thus accessing every bit, four bits at a time. Admittedly, these cartridges did load a heck of a lot faster than tape. It was basically almost instantaneous. But with load time being the only advantage, and the cartridges costing a heck of a lot more than tape, well, you can imagine how well those sold. And that's why there's so few cartridge-based games for the Acorn Electron. They just didn't sell well. And again, not everyone had the plus one, although quite a lot of Acorn Electron users did. Speaking of games, it probably is time that we looked at some of the games on the Acorn Electron. After all, that's really what they were aiming this machine at. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I'm not really a gaming review channel. There, there are people who do that better than me, so I will point you to some of them in a moment. Now, as you can see on the screen, we have up Elite. This is probably the game I spent the vast majority of my time on the Acorn Electron playing. I mean, way more than anything else. I 
So many hours spent on this game. Now, those of you very familiar with the definitive version of Elite for the 8-bit platforms, the BBC version, will notice that it does look a little bit different. On the BBC version, this radar and HUD section at the bottom, well, that's in colour, but on the Acorn Electron version, it's in black and white. Now, the reason for that is because this is all drawn in one screen mode. On the version for the BBC, they used the timer to work out when they'd hit this bottom section of the screen and flip the display mode so you could have a few colours, but also it took up less memory as it was in a lower resolution. But because the Acorn Electron didn't have the event that let you time when to do the mode change, that's not there, so it's all just drawn in the one screen mode. So, hence it all being in black and white. But more awkwardly for the developers of Elite, it means the Acorn Electron version needs a bit more screen memory, which means that other things like code and variables had to go to make room for that bit more screen memory. So the Acorn Electron version of Elite is missing a few features. Um, nothing really that important. It's the Fargoids, basically, that are missing, which is one of the alien races in Elite that you occasionally run into when hyperspace jumps go wrong. Yeah, your hyperspace jump malfunctions, you end up in witch space, and then you get killed by a bunch of Fargoids. Um, so it wasn't exactly the biggest feature to lose, let's put it that way. It also doesn't draw on the screen the local star you happen to be near either. Frame rate wise, it is a little bit slower than the BBC Micro, but not, you know, Commodore 64 port bad. And here's the next game I buried a large chunk of my childhood in, Repton. A Boulder Dash-like game, named after the school where apparently one of the people who wrote it went to. It is incredibly fun to play, and I love playing this on the Acorn Electron. This is a really good version of it. Other games were ported from the BBC that people thought would not be ported to the Acorn Electron, like Exile. Um, it is worth mentioning that there's this whole thing going around the outside, so some of the screen memory is used for storing stuff for the game, and there isn't really the hardware features to blank that out, so... You, you can see that stuff in the Acorn Electron version. Um, weirdly, this in no way distracted me from playing it as a kid. I, Yeah, it's still a really cracking game and works very well on the Acorn Electron. There's just this weird border thing going on. Now, here's another game you might think the Acorn Electron would struggle to do, Firetrack. Now, on the BBC, this used some clever hardware features to make it scroll really, really smoothly. And on the Acorn Electron, it doesn't really have those features. The game was originally created by Nick Pelling, who has created some of my favourite games for the BBC Micro. But the Electron port was handled by Chris Terran, and is impressively smooth. I mean, they've done some tricks about where the screen draws. So as you can see, there's a very generous area for the score at the top to avoid it having to update quite so much screen. But given the spec differences between the BBC Micro and an Acorn Electron, honest to goodness, this was a really good version of the game. I loved playing this as a kid. One thing, though, that is sadly lacking from the Acorn Electron version of this is the music. One of the things I really liked about Nick Palin's games was they always came with some really cracking tunes, and the BBC version of it, it played a tune all the way through the game. With the Electron not really having enough sound channels for that, well, sadly the music had to go so, you know, you could hear the shooty bits. Uh, of original games for the Acorn Electron, I'll show you one final one. This actually came with my Acorn Electron, and this is Snapper. This is Acornsoft's version of Pac-Man, effectively. And I think this is one of the best of the home Pac-Man-alike games that were available at this point in time. I mean, if you compare this to the likes of Hungry Horus on the Spectrum, yeah, there isn't much competition there, <laughs> is there? Now, I will briefly talk about some new games that aimed for the Acorn Electron, particularly the ones from a person known on Twitter as Zero X Code. Now, he's created two of what have fast become my favourite games on the Acorn Electron, and he does target the Acorn Electron and not the BBC. He's very much aiming for the Electron, and it'll work on the BBC. Now, apart from the gameplay, and I'm not really going to cover that because some people have reviewed this much better than I'm going to. In fact, I'm going to give you a link in the description to a video by Rose Tinted Spectrum who covered Electrum and did it with a degree of style and panache that I will never match. So yeah, go, go check it out after you've watched this video. But what I will talk about with Electrum is the way in which it looks and the way in which it moves. It doesn't behave like what you think an 8-bit platform game should move. The movement is so much more fluid. And this really shows off what the Acorn Electron could do. When you have a coder with enough talent to exploit the machine fully, well, it's capable of great feats. Then he released his follow-up game, Electrobots. 
and that gave us the same fluidity of movement and animation, as well as a big splash of colour and some pretty expansive levels that you can go explore. This is one of those games that if it had come out at the time the Acorn Electron was released, it would have definitely have been a system seller. But following all his posts on Twitter where he's explaining how he was writing this, how he was squeezing every last little drop out of what the Acorn could do, it's quite an impressive feat of coding, it must be said. Now, I've covered the games to a certain extent. Even though it was squarely aimed at the home market, the Acorn Electron was always trying to encourage you to do not game-related things with it. One of the big ways Acorn marketed it was that it was compatible with BBC Basic, the basic your kids were learning at school. And I'm going to put myself on a limb here, and I expect there to be reactions in the comments section. I'm going to say that BBC Basic was the best version of Basic for any of the 8-bit platforms. I feel like I can almost hear some of you drawing in breath and starting to use the phrase, well, actually. But hear me out first. Apart from the fact that BBC Basic was more performant on the 6502 than any other Basic on the 6502, its feature set really does put it somewhat apart. Now, it's got all the stuff you'd expect from any other Basic language, all the usual keywords are there, but you've also got the addition of actual proper procedures and also functions. So you weren't forced to do everything with go to and go sub. So the language kind of didn't force you into being a spaghetti coder. Um, I mean, you could still be a spaghetti coder if you wanted, but you, you didn't have to be. Also, the language supported all the features of the machine. You could use basic to draw. And I don't mean poke values into memory to get something to show on the screen. You had actual basic commands for doing stuff. Same with sound. Now, you may feel like that's a really obvious feature to be in BASIC for a particular platform, but if you didn't program back then, you'll be surprised to discover how many versions of BASIC shipped out with different computers that forgot to include stuff like draw on the screen or make some sound. The Commodore 64 is a classic example of that, a computer all geared around doing decent graphics and sprites and having the SID chip and do music really well. And did it support it in BASIC? No. No, it, it, it didn't. You just had to poke values into RAM if you wanted it to display anything. Now, admittedly, that's got a lot to do with Jack Tramiel being a cheap ass, but we'll, we'll save that one for another video. Another nice thing about BASIC on the Acorn Electron is it isn't pulling double duty like it is on some of the other 8-bit platforms. And what I mean by that is it's got a real operating system, so BASIC doesn't have to fill in the gaps where there's no OS on the machine. I mean, again, I'll take the C64 as an example because lots of people know it. I'm, I'm not, not trying to diss the C64, but there isn't an operating system on that thing when you power it up. You've got a basic interpreter, and that is it. And that's why you get this weird situation where if you want to, say, list what's on the disk, then you load a basic program from the serial port and the processor that's in the disk drive somehow constructs that basic program so that when you run it on your C64, you get a listing of a disk. On the Acorn Electron, for all its supported filing systems, and there are quite a few, especially when you expand it, we'll talk a bit about that later, the operating system knows how to call the filing system ROM and list files out directly. You're not messing around with basic. Basic's not involved there. In fact, if you'd expanded your machine so you could add some ROMs to it, then BASIC doesn't have to be the default language the machine has when it powers on. You can easily just stop using BASIC and go use, for example, LISP. Admittedly, you have to really want to engage in self-harm if you want to swap to LISP as your default language, but hey, yeah, you yeah, could. Ooh, that's going to bring out comments. Admittedly, comments with a lot of parentheses in them. I also haven't mentioned the best feature of BBC BASIC, and that's it's got an inline assembler. Yeah, you can actually write assembly code directly in BASIC on the BBC, and when you hit run, it assembles it, puts it in memory. This means you can take bits of your code where it was going to be a bit too slow in BASIC, and you could write an assembler routine right there in the program and call it directly from BASIC. If you've not been forced to use BASIC on a non-Acorn machine, you don't know how nice that is. I'm going to briefly talk about the Spectrum for a second just to avoid seeming like I'm, I'm somehow down on the C64. If you wanted to do assembler on the Spectrum, you have to buy a third-party assembler and do your assembler in that and assemble it with that, and that would then turn that into a binary block of code that you would then have to load into your BASIC program if you wanted to call it from BASIC. And even then, you're just jumping to a memory location and that's it. 
Whereas your Acorn Electron comes with everything built in you need to do, you know, to develop a game. You just turn it on, there you go, you got your basic editor with inline assembler. You don't need anything else. Those developing games commercially for the Spectrum, well, typically they didn't develop them on the Spectrum. They used them like a Tatung Einstein and all they did was make their code and then load it on the Spectrum to test it. Most things developed for the Electron were either programmed directly on the Electron itself or on a BBC Micro, just because they were also doing the BBC version of the same thing. And that brings me back again to keyboards. The keyboard on the Acon Electron is actually quite nice to program on. It's a perfectly decent keyboard. It's even angled fairly well. You also have this nice feature of these keyboard shortcuts. You can hold down the FN key and press a key and it puts a basic keyword in for you. A ZX Spectrum owners will be pretty familiar with that idea. Except there is a big difference between the Spectrum implementation and the Acorn implementation of that. On the ZX Spectrum, if you happen to type the keyword in in long form, you know, by just typing the letters in, yeah, it, it doesn't work. You have to use the shortcuts. There are no options. On the Electron, you can use the shortcuts, or you can just type in the long form version of it, or even sometimes the abbreviated version of the keyword. Now, you might be worrying that that uses a lot of memory, because you've got to store all those letters. Well, that's not quite what's going on here. Once you finish entering your line and press enter, the line actually gets tokenized into a BBC Basic sim a token system. So the token's what gets stored in memory rather than the actual letters that make up the keyword. And when you get it to list the program, well, it takes those tokens and just turns them back into the long form text version that it then displays on the screen for you. Now, I may have joked about Lisp earlier, and to be honest, Lisp kind of deserves it, but there are many home micros where you can develop in a language like that which programs could then be transferred to run on much larger machines. You could use this cheap Electron to do professional development work on, which is not something you can say of most 8-bit home micros at the time. Also, a lot of the more professional applications for the BBC Micro, they would also run on the Acorn Electron. Admittedly, not all of them, but quite a lot of them. Those that relied on Mode 7, yeah, they, they were never going to work. Right, let's have a little look at some of the hardware add-ons for the Electron. Because again, for a home micro, there were a lot of them. Now we'll start with some of the ones from Acorn. Now we've already mentioned the plus one, the thing that gave us a printer port, a joystick port, and these ROM cartridge slots. And this was probably the most common of add-ons for the Electron. In fact, I think I've seen more Electrons as a kid with the plus one than without. Probably due to Curry's bundling them together at some point. Which is where my one came from. The other big add-on from Acorn was the plus three. The Plus 3 gave you a floppy disk drive. And it wasn't just any old floppy disk drive, it was the new swanky 3.5 inch format of floppy disk drive. The BBC Micro would be mostly using the 5.25 inch format. But fear not, because there was a port on the back of the Plus 3 that let you add a second disk drive to it, so you get yourself a 5.25 and, and plug that into it. The Plus 3 is also where Acorn introduced its ADFS filing system, the advanced disk filing system, that let you have like subdirectories and subdirectories within subdirectories. You know, what we think of as a modern disk filing system. And you could also get yourself a DFS ROM and pop that in, and then you could read the non-hierarchical disk format that was pretty common on the BBC Micro at that point. In fact, the BBC range of computers wouldn't see ADFS as a built-in filing system until the BBC Master came along. Now, you might be wondering what happened to the Plus 2. Well, that never actually came out. That was going to be an Econet interface, apparently, which would have let you connect your Acorn Electron to a, a local area network with BBCs on it. I'm not that surprised that that's the one that got cancelled, because of all the ones you're not going to use in the home, it, it was the LAN. And maybe letting Acorn Electrons come and cannibalise some of your school sales. Yeah, not, not the best plan. However, Barson Computers did go on to make an interface for the Acorn Electron that would let you join an Econet network. And we also have a modern recreation of that as well that just goes in one of the ROM slots on the Plus One. So my Acorn Electron, yeah, it's connected to my Econet network. And this brings us neatly on to third-party upgrades for the Electron. And man, there were a lot of them. Let's start with the ones that are fairly equivalent to the Acorn one. So we have this slogger box, which is the equivalent to the Plus One. and gives me the two ROM cartridges and the same ports on the back. Yes, this is not my original Acorn Electron. And then we have the add-on I really wanted as a kid from Press Electronics. Here we have its implementation of a floppy drive. Yet we have this cartridge that contains all the drive interface electronics and also the ROM. And then we connect to that a fairly standard three and a half inch drive. I mean, I would have loved this thing as a kid, but 
they did cost a fair bit, so I ended up sticking to tape and very patient load times. Now, if you remember as far back as the beginning of this video, and I admit it, it's been a while, I mentioned that they removed all the fancy upgrade ports that the BBC Micro had. Well, third parties created add-ons that you could put into the cartridge slots that added them all back. Now, I've not got one of the original ones of these, but one of the people who helped design them in the first place, well, he's recreated them all, so I have the modern recreation of it here. So, for example, this cartridge here, and its support ROM, gives me access to a tube port, which means I can add a second processor to an Acorn Electron. Yep, I can add another 6502 that's got 64K of memory that can be read 8 bits at a time too. I could stick a PC processor on this and turn this into a PC. I could even stick an ARM processor on this thing and really juice it. But there were also cartridges to add all the other missing interfaces, so the 1 MHz bus. We could add a one that provides that as a port, so you could put a hard drive on an Acorn Electron. Also, the same is true with the user port. So, armed with these extra cartridges, you could add any of the advanced hardware that was available for the BBC Micro to your humble little Acorn Electron, including its full MIDI system. I should also mention, that little cartridge that gives me the ability to have a tube port, it's also got a bit of sideways RAM in there, so I can load ROMs into it as well. There also have been quite a lot of modern hardware add-ons for the Electron as well. Apart from the Econet interface that I mentioned earlier, that I guess won't be for most people who have got an Acorn Electron at home, you also have things like the Elk SD. Now, this is available in the version that can go in your plus one into the cartridge slot, but if you don't have a plus one, there's also a version that just plugs straight onto the expansion slot at the back. And both of these provide you with a little bit of extra RAM, so some of that is used to hold the ROM that lets you access the SD card that's in there, and some of it just becomes available as extra memory. So it takes your Electron up to 48K of RAM. And of course, this memory can be read 8 bits at a time. But the main reason for using this is it lets you load software off the SD card rather than having to wait for tape. And boy, is that an improvement. Now, there's one upgrade for the Electron I've not mentioned yet. By and large, because I don't have one and there isn't a modern recreation of it, unfortunately. So getting hold of it is going to be a bit difficult. And that's the Mode 7 add-on from Jaffa Systems. I mentioned at the beginning of the video that they ended up dumping the teletext mode for the Acorn Electron, because that was done with a whole separate chip in the BBC, and they just didn't have the space on the ULA for it. And that's a real shame, because Mode 7 was very useful. It let you do a semi-graphic system, which, rather than doing proper bitmap graphics, you essentially had character graphics, which gave you a way of doing quite a nice display, but using a very small amount of memory to do it. And quite a lot of bits of BBC software made use of Mode 7, because it was the default mode when you powered the system on as well. With the Acorn Electron missing that, that meant that there was lots of bits of educational software and applications that used Mode 7 that you were never going to be able to use on the Electron, until this thing came out. Now this worked by connecting into the expansion bus, which let it read the relevant blocks of RAM inside the Electron, and you would take your video signal from your Electron, pass it through this, and when it was in teletext mode, it would overlay your teletext text or graphics on top of the Acorn's video signal. So, with a combination of all of these add-ons, you could basically take your Acorn Electron and turn it into a BBC Micro. Admittedly, it would have been cheaper to have bought the BBC Micro to begin with, but hey, you know, you didn't have to spend all the money at once. Now, as I've mentioned all the way through this, Acorn designed this as a home system, a cheap home system. But that didn't stop the Acorn Electron getting used by, well, business. There was a BT-branded version of the Acorn Electron known as the Merlin, which is essentially a stock Acorn Electron, although the case is a little bit different, that pattern on the top's not there. And there's an expansion box on the back, and that contains essentially a number of ROMs containing terminal software, and there's a modem in that thing. And these systems were used as dial-up terminals, so common uses for them were you might see them in banks listing the values of current major stocks and shares. For example, my local Barclays had one doing that. One of their other major uses were by Interflora, you know, the people you could order flowers from over the phone, and your local florist would get the flowers to you. Well, each florist had one of these Merlin terminals, and that's where the orders would show up, and they could print them out and then get on with putting together the flowers and shipping them out to you. 
Now, the Merlin terminals weren't exactly a runaway success for BT, but they seemed to shift a fair amount of them. And they stayed in service for quite a long time. For example, my local florist, even in the mid-90s, still had its Merlin terminal. That's how it was doing stuff. And that branch of Barclays I mentioned, well, that machine was stood there doing its stocks and shares into the early 2000s. Ironically, that branch was on the same street as Arm had their offices as well. So you might be wondering to yourself, is it worth me getting an Acorn Electron now as like a retro computer? And the answer is, well, maybe. The primary reason for butting an Acorn Electron over, say, a BBC Micro back then was the price point. And, well, even now, second-hand Acorn Electrons go for less money than an old BBC. However, if you're only going to have one Acorn machine in your collection, and you don't mind the slight price difference between the BBC Micro and an Acorn Electron, I'd, I'd go with the BBC Micro. However, if you just want all of Acorn's 8-bit systems, one of each, then, yeah, the Acorn Electron is definitely worth it. And here's where I come to what's definitely going to be the most controversial bit of the video. The point where I mean, eh, should I say this? But, but I'm going to on this occasion. Why the Acorn Electron may have only come third in terms of total number of sales of budget home systems, I think it was the best of them. Before the comment system fills up with more bile than a school playground in the 1980s when someone said my computer's better than yours, let me explain what I mean by this. What I'm not saying is that you should have bought the Acorn Electron over the Spectrum, for example. In fact, if you were mostly games focused back then and that's all you wanted out of your home computer, I think you probably should have bought the Spectrum. And that's simply because it had a larger games library. That's the thing it had going for it. It's the one that sold in volume first, so it's the one that had most of the games by the time the Acorn Electron came out. However, I do think the decisions Acorn made in terms of making a budget system and what to put in and what to leave out were a better series of decisions than the one that led to the Spectrum. For a start, they decided to keep some sound functionality in. The Electron actually has a sound chip. They gave it a decent keyboard, one you could use for programming and non-games related tasks without, you know, getting carpal tunnel syndrome. It has a proper operating system. You can do real development on this thing, out of the box. And the biggest thing that I think puts it apart from the Spectrum, which again is the other UK low-cost entry point home computer, is that it didn't use attributes mode for its graphics. There was no color clash, it's just proper straight bitmap graphics. If it had come out before the Spectrum, I think things would have been quite different in terms of the sales volumes involved. By the time the Electron was released, most people who wanted a home computer, especially for gaming, already had a home computer. It had a heavily saturated market it was trying to join into and still became the third most popular machine. It was also the most expandable of all the home budget systems. I mean, the Commodore 64 had a lot of hardware add-ons, but it cost £399, the same price as a BBC Micro. It wasn't a budget-conscious machine. The same with Atari's 8-bit range. Well, if you got all the way to the end, I'd like to say thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed looking at the humble elk. If you enjoyed the video, YouTube's provide this whole thumbs-up system where you can tell it of that fact. And if you'd like to leave a comment in the section below, please do feel free, but remember, Please be nice. I am worried I may have just accidentally reignited the playground wars of the 1980s. And if you'd like to help the channel out, please subscribe as it makes a huge difference to whether YouTube can be bothered showing these videos to anybody or not. 